Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another PFFA presentation. Um, I'm Catherine McBean uh, from PFFA, and we're joined by one of our incredible partners this evening, Nick Weir from the Open Food Network. Um, Nick's going to be telling us a bit about OFN, what they're up to, what how they can help, what they do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, like I say, if you've got a question, you're chomping at the bit to ask a question, do pop your hand up. Nick's, ha Nick's happy to take questions throughout. Um, obviously, try and keep it to relevant to the, the piece we're talking about, if possible. Um, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Bear with me, just letting more people in. <clears throat> OK, fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself on mute and pass over to um, the lovely uh, Nick. And uh, yeah, take it from there. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Catherine. And good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along. Uh, my name is Nick Weir. I am a grower on a community supported agriculture project and I helped to set up a food hub in my hometown of Stroud in Gloucestershire about 18 years ago. So I'll be talking a bit more about food hubs later, um, but just to put this in context, um, as you know, the PFFA is very much encouraging people to grow their own food, however much land they do or don't have, even if that's just a window box. There is lots you can do. And if you look on the PFA, PFFA website, you can get some tips and tricks there. But also to encourage us all to support our local farmers and growers who are having a particularly hard time at the moment. And again, have a look on the PFFA website. It's not just the really difficult weather conditions we're experiencing. There's also um, food shortages being caused by um, the political instability around the world and all sorts of other influences on, on farmers, which means that we do need to build local food systems that are resilient and sustainable and safe. If you go back a couple of years during the pandemic, what we saw is a complete breakdown in our global food systems. We found the supermarket shelves were empty. We found that farmers and growers had products in their polytunnels and in their fields that had been grown for the hospitality trade and all the cafes and restaurants were closed and they couldn't shift this produce because they didn't have the local supply chains. So what we saw with the Open Food Network, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, is, is using the tools that we've got in the Open Food Network uh, toolkit, people were building short food supply chains. They were building direct connections between the people who were growing the food and rearing the food and the people who were eating it. So you've got this very short and safe food supply chain where people could see the farmers and the growers they were buying from. They could they could make a direct trading relationship with each other. Um, and we saw the turnover through the Open Food Network platform go up by 850% in seven weeks during lockdown. And that was because our, our global food systems were were not doing what, we, what we've come to rely on them to do. So we are going to talk tonight about how we do that, how you can get involved in supporting your local farmers if you're growing your own food or if you're a farmer yourself how you can how you can sell direct to the to the public um if you are a farmer or a grower who doesn't want to sell direct to the public then there are ways of setting up what we call a food hub and a food hub brings together multiple producers we'll be looking at a, a hub down in devon in a moment i'll show you some uh, screens of that food hub where there are about 80 producers who've come together. Um, one of the farmers has set up one of their barns to be a distribution point. And we've got a single shop front where the shoppers and the buyers can come along. They can place an order from multiple different producers. All of that produce is brought together um, on one shop front so they can order uh, as much product as they like. And then the, the Open Food Network system sends a purchase order out to all of those producers to tell them what needs harvesting that week. The producers harvest and prepare that produce, bring it together, and it's then distributed from the barn, either to pick up points or on a home delivery service or people coming actually to the farm to pick it up. So before I get into the screen share, um, Catherine's going to let me know if there's any questions come up. Please do either raise your hand, put something in the chat, or, oh, there is something in the chat already. What's that in the chat? No toilet rolls. Just about oh, my toilet word. Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
Yeah, I, I'm really happy to be interrupted, uh, but I'm I'm also going to plow through quite a lot of detail, um, and I will be putting up some links towards the end uh, for for anyone who wants more detail. Um, but let me give you a brief introduction to the Open Food Network. It is a global community of farmers, growers, food producers of every type. I've talked about farmers and growers a lot, but we've got bakers and brewers and bottlers and people making jams and cakes. Any kind of food um, that is made locally is available on the Open Food Network. And these, this community of people, together with a few software geeks who believe in open source software, have developed this toolkit to, to make it easy for people to buy local food and for people who've, who are growing the food to get it to the people local to them. Um, I mentioned the word open source. There's, there's lots of platforms like this. You can go out there and find all sorts of bits of software that will do exactly what I'm gonna show you tonight. As far as I know, the Open Food Network is the only open source software platform. We believe that open source is important because we believe that the current food system is broken because of issues of ownership and control. Probably the most striking example is that in the UK, we've got seven big supermarket corporations that control about 90% of food distribution in the UK which I believe is a dangerous situation to be in for those corporations to decide what we eat, how much we pay for it, what's available, what's not available. Um, so when we started 15 years ago building this platform, we decided we needed something that was in common ownership. That's what open source means. It means that this platform cannot be sold. It cannot be taken over. If you don't like what we are doing with that platform, you can set it up yourself. You can take that software and you can deploy it yourself. So I've got a question, Nick. Um, yeah. Just going to just because they're starting to come now. Yeah. Um, looked at your website, but not clear what your pricing plans are from Tarquin. Right. Do I assume right. you're going to come to that? I will. I will. Let me start sharing my screen. Uh, enough of me no blethering at you. And so, apparently someone's asking where the food hub in Devon is. That's in Seaton, Seaton in South Devon. We'll go there in a minute. Um, let me show you pricing. So let me open a new tab here. So the Open Food Network is free for anyone who's uh, a farmer or a grower. Um, so it, we're, we're encouraging farmers and growers to, to set up on the Open Food Network. Um, wherever you are in the country, please do register. That is completely free. There is no cost at all for registering as a producer. Um, you can then um, put your contact details up there, put a bit of description about what you're growing. You can set up your products on there, put some prices and pictures of your products. And then you can contact any one of the hubs. I'll show you, I'll show you the hubs in a moment. But there are hubs all over the UK who are connecting up those producers and starting to sell their products. The hubs pay the open food network and this is what i'm going to show you now these are our packages if a hub is trading less than 500 pounds a month they are invited to become a member of our co-op um, with the option to make a donation but that is entirely voluntary so it is entirely free um, if you're trading if you're just a, sto a small trader trading less than 500 pounds a month when you hit that magic £500 a month, we ask you to pay 2.4% of your online turnover to the Open Food Network to cover our running costs. So we've got this piece of software. Uh, we've do, we've got servers that run the software, which are fairly expensive. We've got a team of amazing developers all over the world who are developing and improving the software all the time. There's new updates. The software come out every Tuesday. But that's expensive, so we do ask for a contribution to to our costs. And as your turnover goes up, that percentage comes down um, because we we there's a limit to how much. We are not for profit. We're not in this to make money. We're in this to build local food systems. So we we ask for a decreasing percentage of your sales as your sales go up. And we have got some very big. Uh, farmers and growers on our system who are trading large volumes of food and they negotiate with us a deal that's not based on a percentage it'll just be a fixed a fixed price but let me talk a bit more about the map first so there's several thousand producers already registered um, we don't um sorry was that screen in front of my pricing all the time um sorry i can't i can't tell what you're seeing and what i'm seeing um this is the map um 
several thousand producers, farmers, growers, brewers, bottlers, bakers, and so on. Um, these are the shop symbols, and you can you can zoom in on our map and 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 have a look at um, what's happening in your area. Also on this map, you'll see these shop icons, um, and these shops could be one of several things. They might be a farmer or a grower who's selling direct from the farm. And they've got uh, they've got their products listed there, and then whenever they um, uh, maybe once a week they have a day when people can come and collect their produce. If the farm I, I mentioned earlier that farmers and growers are free to register, that is entirely true as long as that farmer and grower is selling through a hub. But if the farmer or grower is selling direct, then we do ask them to pay a percentage of their turnover, because they are they are then trading on the Open Food Network platform. And if they trade more than five hundred pounds a month, we ask them to pay a percentage. We've got but, a question on that one, Nick. Um, okay. How do you police turnover for slash sales? How do you police that? What does yeah, that look like? Basically, we have got um, a deployment of this software. This 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 open source software. We've set up servers. All of these people are trading through through our our platform, and we have a database that every time a product is sold through the open food network we know who grew it how much they charged for it any markup that might be made by the hub um, who bought it uh, how much they paid for it and that data is basically stored on a secure server with gdpr restrictions and safeguards and so on but we basically know how much is being sold to all the shops so at the end of each month, we can run a program that tells us anyone who's traded over 500 and it automatically sends an invoice to them. But you are invoiced in arrears. So if there is a month where you go over 500, at the end of that month, after you've traded, we will then send you an invoice for 2.4% of what you've sold that month. And you then get 30 days to pay. So in terms of cash flow, um, we're charging after the event. Most... Someone asking, what is the program run on, Nick? Sorry. Uh, you might be asking about the server, in which case it is a... I uh, can't remember who our server... We've just recently changed server providers. Uh, we're trying to find the most, es most ethical and environmentally friendly server providers. And I will have to look that up for you. If you're asking about the software language, it's written in Ruby on Rails, um, which you may or may not be familiar with. Happy to take more no. questions on that. Um, and so someone said, so in essence, uh, is it a Shopify for food markets? The food it's, market? very, it's very similar to Shopify. Shopify is proprietary software. So I mentioned earlier about open source. So the opposite to open source is proprietary. Shopify is owned by a corporation, which means that as, as ethical as Shopify might be, and, and many of those proprietary software platforms are built by people with very strong ethics, but... If it's proprietary software, they own it, which means they could, if they got a good enough offer, they could sell it. And it could be Tesco who would buy it. <laughs> so you might jump from the frying pan into the fire with proprietary software. You don't know who, you don't know about the future of that software. You don't know who's deciding how it will be developed, how much it will be charged, who's going to own it. Um, but yes, we are looking at something that is very, very similar to, to Shopify, except that it's owned yeah. and controlled by the farmers and growers. We've got another one coming in. Okay. Who pays the 2.4%? Is it the producers or the hub? And yeah. if it's the hub, where does their income come from? Yep. The hub will make a markup on the producer's sales. Um, I'm going to come to that later. So I will answer that question later. The hub will make an income by adding a small percentage or well, they can decide the percentage onto the producer's selling price. And that's where their income comes from. Um let me just run through these different shops. I did say that some of them might be farmers and growers selling direct. Um, if the farmer is having their own shop front, which is unusual in the UK, most of them do sell through a, through a hub. But if the farmer is selling direct, they will be paying a percentage to the Open Food Network. But most of these will be hubs. And I'll show you a hub in a moment with multiple producers on one shop front. Some of them might be food banks or community larders distributing surplus or, or free food to people who can't afford to pay full price. Some of them might be online farmers markets. Some of them might be um, food co-ops or buying groups who are buying in from wholesalers and they're buying bulk at wholesale prices and then splitting that produce and, and distributing it to their members at lower than retail prices. 
Um, so there's many, many different ways of using this platform to, to, to sell your produce. And then we network them together. So all of the producers you look at on this map could trade with each other and they could trade with all the hundreds of shops that are buried underneath those those piles of of, of producers um so we have this amazing sort of mycelium this amazing network of distribution moving food between the people who are growing it and the people who are eating it you're all very interested in the hub so let me take you to one of these hubs here we go we're going down to devon uh this is down in seaton um this is their website it's not the open food network this is their website um it's a wordpress site they've designed it they're completely in control of this website it's nothing to do with the open food network and they will use it to tell people about what they're doing how they're doing it um they're part of a program called the good food loop that has connected up four different food hubs so this is the hubs bring together the producers and then you can join the food hubs up together and build regional food systems um, which is I, I can talk more about that later if you're interested um, but if you click on their shop tab that's when the open food network kicks in and we're now in the open food network we're looking at the notices page for the um, for this particular hub which is called in my backyard and here we can see the list of producers some of them very small scale, literally people who are growing a bit of veg in their back gardens. They might be selling allotment produce. Uh, it is legal to sell surpluses from your allotment as long as most of the food goes to the allotment holder. Um, some of the, you've got beekeepers on here, you've got fishermen on here, um, breweries, all sorts of different producers. And you can click on any one of these and find out more detail about who the producers are. But if we go to their shop, um, so they've got a weekly order cycle. They've got uh, orders every Friday afternoon. People come and collect their orders. Um, and then down the right-hand side here, you can filter by the type of product. Uh, you can also filter by the, what we call properties. So if you're only interested in organic or fair trade or only local produce or plastic free or vegan or whatever, you can filter on those uh, properties. But let's just have a look at what fish might be available this week. Um, you can see, a lot of detail this is put up by the producer the producer will put up detail about their product any allergens there might be any uh, any detail about the fish um, and a picture of the produce and it's really important to us that you can see who 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 is the producer so that you have transparency and you can if you want to you can contact the producer and ask some questions um, you can see pictures of the producers a bit about their history their phone number their social media links and you can you can have a direct connection with the producers but somebody asked a question about how does the hub make money and this is where the open food network cut comes from but you if you click on the little pie chart beside the price you can see that this particular crab is being sold so beer fisheries are making seven pound fifty from each of these crabs and this hub has agreed with the producer that they will put a 20 percent markup and they do a they do a different markup depending on the type of product. Um, they also the, the markup will also vary depending on how much work the producer does. So some producers will deliver to the hub. Some producers will say, "I'm really sorry, I can't deliver. You have to pick up from me." In which case, the hub will make a bigger markup. Some producers collect for each other, and and rather than everyone coming into the hub, they'll pick up produce from another producer, and then the person who does the pickups will add a markup to that as well. So there might be several markups on there, but it's all entirely transparent to the shopper. And this is what covers the running costs of the hub. Um, so a hub might have cost for premises. The hub that I'm part of, we use a school hall on a Saturday morning. So the school isn't using the hall. They want us. They want the community to use the hall. Um, so they give us the hall free of charge. But quite a lot of hubs will use a village hall, or they might have a. They might use a, the back room of a pub or something as their as their distribution point, and they will need to pay a contribution for the for the cost of running the, running the hub. They will probably want to pay someone to run the hub. So they might pay somebody for. A day a week to run the hub and to to manage the food drops and do the distribution they might want to pay their drivers to do home deliveries and deliveries to pick up points um, and so that all of those costs will be covered by the markup that the hub makes 
and the hub is in charge of that markup. They decide what the markup should be. I've got a couple of questions here, um, yeah. Nick. I'll just jump in so we don't yeah. lose them too many. Yeah. Um, do small producers need to register with local council to sell produce to a hub? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, the ideal is you phone your local authority, your local council, you tell them what you're doing. They will ask a few questions. If you're growing vegetables, it will be a very short conversation. <laughs> they will take a few details off you and they will then register you as a food business. It then escalates. So if you happen to be butchering and cutting meat in your kitchen, then they will definitely want to come and visit <laughs> and they will want you to have two two sinks and blah 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 and hygienic work surfaces blah 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 but what we find is that they are incredibly supportive that most local authorities want to encourage food production they want more small-scale food producers um, so if you're baking cakes then they'll want to visit and just make sure that you've got all your hygiene in place but it's it's a, there's no cost to it and there is no um, they do, and certainly in my experience, all the all the councils I've dealt with have been very encouraging. But yes, you will need to register as a food business. Brilliant. Do the hubs help the producers with their write-ups? Yes, they do. So it depends so, on the hub. It depends a lot on the hub. Um, and it also depends on how much that, that hub manager wants that producer. So there, I, I've, I've worked with several new hubs where they've got... They've got lots of veg lined up. They've got two or three meat producers. Uh, they might have someone making, making jams and cakes and so on, but they can't find a dairy producer for love and money. And dairy production is going down, as, as, as Catherine will testify. It's really hard. Dairy producers are really struggling. So if, if you find somebody who is, who is producing milk and cheese locally and they say, yeah, okay, I'm happy to sell my product through you, but... I hate computers, you'll have to do it all for me, then you can with the Open Food Network, you can, with their permission, obviously you need to get the permission of the producer, but you can actually set up a producer on the Open Food Network, put all their details in, put all their products in for them, and then just make them a manager of that enterprise that you've just created. And they will then get the email, they'll get, they'll get the regular weekly emails telling them how much has been ordered, and they will have control of the enterprise. You can do it for them. Absolutely. Fantastic. Does the producer give a retail or a wholesale price? Yeah. Um, the producer will set a price in negotiation with the hub. Um, it's possible for a producer to sell through multiple hubs, in which case they might need to negotiate with several hub producers. It might be that the producer will set their price and say, take it or leave it to the hubs. And the hubs will have to choose whether or not to, to list the, that that producer's products. What, what, what we're doing is we're making it easy for the producers. Um, they don't have to have a supermarket contract. They don't have to take their products to market. They don't have to deal with the distribution. They don't have to deal with the marketing. That's all covered by the hub. So most producers are willing to go quite a lot below farm gate prices because the hub is doing all that work for them. Um, but it does vary massively. It, it's somewhere between wholesale and retail price. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and then following up on that, same person said, and I don't know if this is your bag, Nick, or whether we need to bring somebody else to help with this. Um, I know there's groups out there. I think you and I have actually um, spoken with a lady who do do this, but they're asking, would you tell us about marketing the hub so you can so that they can build a viable customer base? Yes. Or is that somebody else? You no, would? no, okay. that's me. I'm going to show you a screen on that. Uh, this is what... So the Open Food Network is is a, is a clever piece of software and it's getting cleverer by the week. But for me, more importantly than the, the software is this amazing network of brilliant people who are setting up all sorts of different hubs and co-ops and buying groups and food banks and community larders and sharing their ideas and sharing their information. So we've, we've developed this resources hub where people can come along, they get marketing tips, stuff on legal and, and regulations. All of this is open source. It's all free. And if you scroll down there, um, there's case studies and there's, oh, I, don't, I, I need to come back to that. But a lot of the 
producers using the Open Food Network are now getting into public procurement, which means selling into schools and hospitals and a lot of public sector buyers who want to buy local, but many of the producers are too small to, to meet a public sector contract. So a, a school might be wanting to buy 100 kilos of carrots every week. It's unlikely that small scale producers can meet that. But when you network them together and you have six or seven different producers growing carrots between them they can meet that 100 kilos a week so we are doing quite a lot of work around public procurement um, but if you keep going down marketing tips so here you go so these are webinar recordings um which i think might answer your question um and you're very welcome to 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 have a look at those the, the blog posts and webinar recordings um and uh, there's loads more stuff being added there all the time so yeah, please do look at our resources page. Um, I'll put this link up in the chat. I'll do that now while I remember. But I know that Catherine will be putting out links with this recording as well. Um, Thank you for saying that. That reminds me nicely. <laughs> um, also, I had a question come in saying, in looking at my backyard, is there a website built on your platform? And as such, is it your database and inventory management system? Their website is not built They're... on our platform. So their website is, is built in WordPress and you can build a website in any platform you like and then link it to the Open Food Network. But the shop that we've been looking at, so this bit of the of of the of the In My Backyard hub is part of the Open Food Network. Yes. So there the database that I talked about earlier, um, in my backyard, anything they sell through this part of their website that is open food network and that is being that is feeding into this huge database that we're building which gives us a lot of information about where local food is being grown how much is being charged for it where it's being sold who's buying it blah 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 yes fabulous another one they're coming in thick and fast now nick <laughs> uh, what determines the hub's percentage cost on top of what items are sold the hub manager decides that so when I talked here about this particular fish, um, that will be a conversation between beer fisheries and In My Backyard. And beer fisheries will say, yeah, I want to sell my products through you. In My Backyard will say, that's great. We normally charge a 20% markup. Is that okay? There might be some haggling that goes on. There might be the hub saying, well, okay, we can reduce our markup if you'll deliver to the hub. Um, but that is entirely decided by the producer in negotiation with the hub manager yeah absolutely um who is responsible if a product sold through a hub has an issue okay so initially the person who has an issue will contact the hub manager and the hub manager will say okay tell me tell me what's gone wrong what's the detail what what's the problem um it might be that the problem has been caused by the hub they might have damage something in transport or whatever, in which case the hub will negotiate with the customer and either give them a refund using the Open Food Network platform. They might say, you know, they, they might say, we'll, we'll deliver it to you now, or they might say, can we have, can we deliver it to you next week? But that conversation will happen between the hub and the, and the, and the shopper. If the issue is to do with the quality of the produce, the hub will then talk to the producer. So if a product has come in underweight, that would be an issue that would go back to the producer and the hub manager would take that up with the producer. The producer would then provide some kind of compensation and that will be then passed on to, to the shopper. Um, and if ultimately there is some serious problem like food poisoning and that is caused by the producer, then the 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 shopper will have a case against that producer so it might be necessary for that producer to have insurance in the case of some kind of uh, event like that in the eight nine years that the open food network's been running in the uk i've never heard of that happening but most hubs do encourage their producers if they're selling something that might be an issue around things like food poisoning, they do encourage them to take out insurance. Brilliant. Fantastic. Final question for the moment, and we'll let you carry on. <laughs> uh, can the role of a hub manager be shared? 
Yes, definitely. Um, so there's lots of bits of the role. Um, a hub manager will be doing quite a lot of work with producers, signing up new producers. Some producers, bless them, are incredible at producing food. They grow the most amazing carrots. They rear the most amazing meat. They bake the best bread in the world, but they hate computers, as I said earlier. So as well as the hub manager being able to set them up, it is possible for the hub manager to manage their enterprise for them. So quite a lot of hub managers will end up on the phone to producers once a week saying, you haven't updated your stock. What have you got available this week? And the hub, the, the producer will then tell the producer, will tell the hub manager, okay, yeah, can you put broccoli on this week? Or the carrots have stopped cropping for a while. Can you take the carrots off? Or can you change the picture or whatever? And so hub managers sometimes have to do that extra work. And in those cases, they will charge a higher markup to cover the hub manager's time. But that's a piece of work that can be, that one person could do. Another piece of work is uh, doing social media work around the hub. And that's a discrete piece of work that a separate person could do. Um, a third piece of work that's not at all to do with computers is on the day when all this produce, you can imagine in my backyard, 80 different producers all delivering product into a, a barn. And there'll be fridges and freezers there for the children frozen stuff to go into. Um, there'll be packing lists and picking lists produced by the Open Food Network software that tell the, the, the sorters which box and which bags everything needs to go into. There'll be other reports produced for the drivers who are delivering to pick up points. One of the roles of a hub manager is to coordinate that lot. Um, maybe with a, a group of paid people, maybe with some volunteers, maybe some of the producers offering to help with that piece of work. But that's a really different skill set. So it might be that you want to split the food hub manager job between online and the practical stuff of moving stuff around, partly because sometimes the job on a, on a sort day with a big food hub is quite hard physical work. You know, you've got crates of milk and apple juice and you've got, you know, big boxes of vegetables that need to be moved around. So you might need someone, you know, who's physically strong to do that kind of work. Any other questions before I carry on with the demo? Nope. Okay. So let's imagine we're going to put an order in. Uh, let's stick a bit of fish in our basket. And let's have a look at... Um, I want to show you something that might have a different... Um, uh, let's see what they've got in terms of non-food. So I mentioned, I've mentioned a lot of food items, but quite a lot of hubs will do non-food. So I'm just going to change the filter. I'm going to take the fish off and just put non-food on and see what they've got. Oh no, okay. So that's just donations to the um to the food hub. Um quite a lot of food hubs are run on a not for profit basis and they just they take um they take donations. So yeah, let's look at some vegetables, um some meat. Oh my word, what have I done? <laughs> Never do a live demo. It all goes horribly wrong. Um I'm gonna clear my filters, that's what I've done wrong. Um, So, let's um, take off these filters. So yeah, let's look at some bread products. Um, so here's somebody um, selling their bagels. Um, and again, you can look at the you can look at the description of the product. You can find out who 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 is who's baking it. Um, these guys are paying twenty five percent, so this is a higher markup than the one we looked at just now. Uh, so then there's two different markups added on here. Um, for some reason, these guys maybe they're not delivering to the hub, and the hub has to collect from them. Um, and there's also this I talked about earlier about um, food hubs being joined together. This is the Southwest Good Food Network, which links up four different hubs. So these people who are producing bagels are unlikely to be actually in the same geographical areas in my backyard. They'll be they'll be linked to one of the other hubs and they will come into one of the neighboring hubs and then there'll be a van that will distribute who distribute food between the hubs so you end up with this regional food network and that van has to cover its running costs so they charge a 10 percent fee on top of the hub markup to cover that distribution um, which makes the bagel slightly more expensive but let's maybe add them into our add them into our basket as well 
So we've now got a couple of things in the basket. Uh, we then check out. I should have signed in before I um, before I did this. Let me just sign in as sign in as me. Um, so there is a possibility to do a guest checkout if you don't want your customers to have to record their address details. Some people can do guest checkouts, uh, but I've checked in with with my home address there. And once I've checked in, um, I can then choose where I want to pick up my produce from. So these guys have got lots of different pickup points. And if you click on them, you can then see where exactly is the pickup point and any details about the pickup point. Uh, during lockdown, we were doing lots of social distancing stuff at pickup points. Um, and you'll notice that all of these are free. Um, there is the option for the pickup point to make a charge. So if you talk to a local pub and you say to them, we'd really like to deliver 10 or 15 boxes to your to your pub once a week, the pub might say, that's grand, it'll increase footfall to the pub, I'll do that for free. Or they might say, I'll do it, but I want to charge a pound for each or two pounds or whatever for each each box that I that I look after. And, and that fee is charged at checkout and the customer pays that fee and that then gets passed on to the pickup point. Um, so I've chosen my pickup point. I've put in any special comments about exactly, you know, how I want them to manage my order. Um, I then go to payment method. Um, we obviously can take uh, credit and debit cards. Uh, these people are only taking credit and debit cards. Um, but it is possible to do it with bank transfers um, because cards, you will pay a transaction fee. So PayPal charges 4% transaction fee. Stripe charges 1.4% plus 20p per transaction. But that is another cost that the hub would have to bear. So some people will take bank transfers instead. Some people will do payment by invoice. Some will allow people to pay cash on collection. Um, but you can set up as many different payment methods as you like. Um, you put your card details in, you get an order summary, and then an email comes to the shopper to confirm the order. So it's a pretty standard e-commerce back end. Um, We've got some questions, questions. Nick. Do you want I'll me to pause jump for in with a couple yes, of those? Please. Yes, please. Can independent butchers or one of the few remaining <clears throat> veg shops work with a hub or are they quite simply competition? We would love them to work with the hub. And if somebody is setting up a new hub, we strongly encourage them to talk to people who are already trading in that area. So if you want to set up a food hub and you've got a green grocer, you're very lucky for a start <laughs> or a butcher. Um, and the last thing we want to do is to be in competition with them. So what we would do is we'd say to the green grocer, we'd like to set up a hub. The hub will cover a, a much wider range of produce than just vegetables. But is it possible for us to sell your vegetables so that it expands the 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 shopper base for that for that green grocer so that there may be stuff you so the green grocer will almost certainly be selling bananas and oranges and stuff that isn't grown locally and if you can put them onto the onto the food hub that increases the turnover for the green grocer and then you can decide with your broccoli and your carrots and your potatoes whether you're going to give that business to the green grocer as well and or if you want to use local growers for that for that produce, you can do both. You can put them both on the same food hub. So it's, there's no reason why you shouldn't have two or three different carrot producers on your food hub. And it might be that the green grocer is willing to sell them in you know 10 kilo sacks, whereas a local grower wants to sell them by the bunch. And the local seller will have them with the top still on. So that even though they're both selling carrots, there's some differentiation there. But yeah, please, if you're thinking of setting up a food hub, do think about who's already there and how you can build them into your plans for the food hub so that you're not in competition with your local small scale retailers. Brilliant. Brilliant. Fantastic. Uh, Paul says, in my research, it seems a lot of the hubs are CIC. Is this just an ethics type scenario? And is there an issue of running a hub as a non CIC forward slash private enterprise uh, you're right quite a lot of them are cic's and you're absolutely right that of course anyone can set up a food hub on the open food network it does not need to be a not-for-profit it does not need to be a cic quite a lot of the businesses on there are um limited companies sole traders partnerships 
that are for-profit enterprises. So it's completely fine to run a business on the Open Food Network using any kind of um, legal structure as long as you fit within our values. So when you when you sign up to the Open Food Network, you're signing up to these values. There are nine of them. Um, they're pretty broad, um, but as long as you're being kind <laughs> with your business and meeting these other values, then you're very, very welcome to, to trade on the Open Food Network. Okay, uh, Tarquin again. Are you able to demonstrate the CRM part of the platform, how businesses can operate the website, build and manage their inventory, review dashboard and analytics, et cetera, as you're showing it purely from how um, a consumer engages? Yeah, good point. Uh, move on, Nick. You're running out of time. So let me go back <laughs> here. Um, I've already We've got signed... other questions yet, mate, as well. Oh, right. Okay, I'll, I'll be really quick. Of course, there no are. Problem. No um, problem. I'm going to let, let me just sign in again. Um, D. I'm going to sign in with a slightly different uh, login um, because I haven't shown you the back end at all. This is where if you've got your own enterprise on the open food, if you're not a shopper, but you've got your own, if you're a producer or a shop, you will have this little button that appears, which takes you into the admin. And there's loads of stuff here that I could spend a long time talking to you about. You can add products. Uh, you can produce loads of different reports. You can look at the orders as they come in. You can set up tags on your customers. So if you want a customer to be able to pay cash on delivery, but you don't want every other customer to be able to do that, you can tag certain customers. Uh, you can also use tags to, to make certain products available to customers. So during lockdown, uh, we were running out of produce and we were having to enable key workers to have access to the shop front before other people. So there's loads of ways of customizing the shop front. Um, and you can um, do all sorts of clever things. If you are a producer, you will then get a settings page um, where you can set up um, your about page, your contact details, your social media links. Um, you can give permission to different shops to to use, uh, to sell your products. Um, and if you're a shop, you will also be able to manage your payment methods and your shipping methods. Let's see if I can find a shop here. Shop, there we go, zero dig is a shop. Um, and the shop will have payment methods and shipping methods. So whether you want to uh, take payments by credit card or cash or whatever, and then you'll be able to see those here. Um, where are we? Uh, vouchers, enterprise permissions. Uh, no, they're not a they're not a shop. They're just a producer. I'm wrong about that. But in this in this drop down list, you would see shipping methods and payment methods there. Uh, if they were not just a producer, if they were also a shop. Um, next question, please. The Open Food Network don't have a group approach or PayPal to get a lower percentage. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a good question. We don't like PayPal, basically. Um, <laughs> um, we encourage people to use Stripe instead of PayPal. And we are in negotiations with Stripe to get a reduced percentage on Stripe. The reason we don't like PayPal is that the admin of it is difficult. So setting up a PayPal account is very admin heavy and security heavy. Um, and also quite a lot of our shop fronts who've used PayPal have had problems downloading payments and PayPal just don't have such good customer service in our experience. Um, but we are building up quite a reputation with, with Stripe and we believe that will get us a, a, a cut in the transaction fee fairly soon as we, as we build up our customer base. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let me know your secrets to that one as well. We can do with that PFFA. <laughs> uh, final question for the moment. Yep. If we had a number of local growers and businesses all contributing to one hub, can we organize this so these businesses will get paid individually, but the collection point is the same locally? Yes. Um, so basically, I'm not sure I understand that question. Let me explain. Maybe you can unmute and check, tell me if I'm answering your question here. But basically what will happen is that the shop will take all of the orders over a week. They will they will happen automatically. And if the hub manager wants to check the orders as they're coming in, they can do that. It might be that some people will will uh, sub hub some hubs will take phone orders. So for, for shoppers and buyers who are who 
don't have internet access, they can phone an order in, and that can be added into the, into the system. But at the end of a week, what we call it, we call each week an order cycle. So they might be weekly order cycles, they might be daily, they might be monthly. But at the end of an order ordering period, the software will automatically send out a purchase order to all of the producers. So the producers will know exactly what to produce and what needs delivering that week. Um, the produce gets delivered to the hub. The hub will check that what has been ordered has been delivered. And assuming that everything has been delivered according to the purchase order, the hub manager can then make payments to each of the producers. So the producers will, will give their bank details to the hub and the, the hub manager will then make bank transfers to each of the producers. Um, the hub will then have all the products together. They will sort it into boxes and bags and so on. And they will, depending on what shipping methods they've set up, they will do some of those as home delivery and the shopper will pay extra for home delivery. They will do some of them to pick up points which might be free to the shopper or the shopper might have to pay a little bit extra at the pickup point or the shopper might come to the hub, which might be the farm or it might be a school hall. It might be a back room of a pub and they might collect from the hub itself. Um, and I'm not sure if that answers your question. So whoever asked that, if I didn't answer it, please, can you clarify your question? Hi, Nick. It's Paul. Um... Hello, Paul. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, good. And um, yeah, so so we we've sort of created. It's really good actually because we we created something locally, but um, Open Food Network has has already done it. So so I love I love to know more about um, your website because it's brilliant. It's amazing. Great, thank you. Um, it, we 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 basically we, what we were trying to do is is contact local growers um and give them a storefront which is similar to what you've done in Open Food Network. Yeah um but then from the front end it would just be like ordering from a supermarket so it's, it's convenient for the customers so yeah. you would have like 10 people or say say you've got for example 10 stores mm. or 10 growers um one grown i'll just give really example so so one's growing broccoli one's growing leeks one grow, one's growing potato but from the front end it just looks like a supermarket yeah. but when people purchase it directly goes to the, the growers um so the orders and the payment goes directly to the growers but then they would then deliver to the collection points and then you would bag it all up and then either send it out by delivery or they will come and collect it. Right. Interesting. OK, um, so, yes, we do it in a slightly different way, um, but it's very, very similar because we wanted to make sure that the hub could quality control it before the producer gets paid. So they wanted to check that it's all been delivered and that, you know, if the eggs were delivered, they would they weren't broken and so on so that the the hub would be would have that sort of check before it went out to the to the to the shopper um but yes i'd really like to talk to you about what you're doing and how you're doing it uh, because we're also working on an interoperability project uh, where we're developing a data standard so it might be that you if if you were able to fit in with our data standard that you could link up with the open food network and join in with the existing hubs that are on the open food network without having to change your software so that your software could be integrated and we could integrate with you, you could integrate with us. Um, and I'll be very happy to talk to you about that. But that's probably a bit of a techie conversation that I'm at, A, I'm out of my depth and B, would take up too much time in this in this webinar. So yeah, please do contact me. Um, let me stick my email address or maybe I could ask Catherine to stick my email address into Thanks, the chat. That'd Thank be you. amazing. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, and the screen I'm looking at now is the reports, which I didn't mention. Um, uh, well, I did talk about these reports. So at the end of an order cycle, we produce loads of different reports. One is showing all the customer details. So everything that's been ordered that in, the, in that order cycle, sorted by customer. So you can see Mrs. Jones has ordered two loaves of bread and six lamb chops and a kilo of potatoes and a kilo of carrots. And you can see who they've come from and what price she's paid and it's all in one pdf one one report that can be printed off so that as the carrots go into the box you can you can tick off to make sure that everything is going into the right box and another report which is sorted by supplier so that as the 30 rates of milk arrive you can see that you know 
uh, one litre of full fat goes in Mrs. Jones's box and two litres of full fat goes in Mr. Smith's box and so on. Um, just makes it very easy for the packers to, to get the right products in the right boxes. Um, so lots of picking and packing reports there. Um, lots of reports that link to zero is one of our accounting systems we link to. We also link to QuickBooks and uh, various other accounting packages. Um, we link to various uh, CRM systems like MailChimp and so on, so that you can you can dump your customer details out into into a, a CRM system. So a lot of food hubs will send out an email just before the order cycle closes, reminding people to put their order in, or it might send out an email as the order cycle opens to tell people that asparagus is starting to crop now, and if you want to get your asparagus, order early to make sure you get your order in. Any other questions? There's loads of stuff I could talk about, but I want to make sure that I answer questions first. Um, someone's just added, this is the last one I've got currently at the moment. Yeah. Um, Hub is good for quality control, but doesn't it add um, in a slower process for the consumer? Yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, the simplest way to use the Open Food Network is to buy direct from the farm. So if a farmer is willing to set up their own shop front and you can just have a a direct relationship with the with the farm there's no markup because the farm will set their selling price to cover all of their costs and you will just pay the farmer whatever they uh, whatever they charge the farmer obviously will need to think about the fact that they are going to have to deal with customers they're going to have to deal with um taking payments they're going to have to deal with managing the shop front um so they they may want to charge a bit extra for that, but that does simplify a lot if if you want to buy from a farm. The downside of that from a shopper's perspective is that you then have to place an order with the meat farmer and you have to place an order with the veg farmer and you have to place an order with the bakery and you have to place an order with the dairy. And you then have to arrange pickup from all of those places or home delivery which is why I think hubs are more popular because they put it all in one place and you can put all of your order in and it all gets gathered together for you and delivered to the same place. Um, but you're right, it, it does add admin um, and it swings and roundabouts, which is why we don't make a decision as to how that, how your local food system is built. You are in charge of that if you want to get direct go direct to each farm then as long as you can find the farmers and you can get them to register on the open food network then you can buy direct from them um, if you'd rather have it all in one place then i'd really encourage you to set up a hub and there's loads of resources on the hub on this resources page um do, do, do case studies where is it um yeah getting started so open my shop and this this little tab here takes you through oh there's uh, for those of you in wales uh, lots of our pages are uh, you can uh, click to to see them in welsh um and then this talks you through uh, how to set up food hubs um what is a food hub um how to how to get started um we'll be covering a little bit of that as well on thursday nick to back that up um uh, right. mark and, and i the bowler hat farmer we're doing a second forum um this thursday seven o'clock Part of that, we'll be talking about um, setting up a hub, uh, but you could just as easily look here, but there might be some different bits of information. So I suggest have a look at both, actually. Yeah. Um, right. And we've got a couple of other questions when you're ready, my love. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to put a link up. So if you are ready to register on the Open Food Network, I'm, I'm on the homepage here, openfoodnetwork.org.uk. Down the bottom there is a register um, tab. As I said earlier, this registration process is completely free. You will not pay to register. You will only pay if you start to sell directly to the public through the Open Food Network. I'll stick that link in the chat. But yes, can I have the question, please, Catherine? Uh, what about managing tax? Yeah. Okay, so um, the producer will be will receive a purchase order and will then be receiving money from the hub and they will be responsible for paying tax on their income from the hub. The hub will be taking payment from the shoppers and the buyers. So the 
quite a lot of hubs will take, as I said earlier, school and hospital orders. They'll also take orders from pubs and restaurants and cafes and so on. But they will receive all of that income um, and they will have some costs, including paying the producers, but they will end up with some profit because their income is higher than their costs and the hub will be responsible for paying tax on their profit. Um, so yes, you will be running a business and you will be needing to do all the things that a business needs to do, um, including registering. The hub itself will need to register with the local council as a food business because you're distributing food. Um, and again, they're very supportive of food hubs, in my experience. Uh, but yes, you, you will need to register as a business. You'll need to uh, uh, register with HMRC and pay your tax. Uh, you might choose to, put, to pay insurance as well. But all of the things of running a business, um, you will need to cover. Fantastic. Um, does OFN have a demo or test site that people can use to learn the system before going live? Yes, it does. So um, I, my, I'm not. I'll put my did, Catherine. Did you put my email address in the chat already or not? Can, can I, I do believe that? I did. Yes. Yeah. So anybody who would like to be a manager of the Open Food Network Demo Hub, send me an email, and I will make your email an admin access to the manager to to the Demo Hub, and you'll then be able to set up order cycles. You'll be able to add products. You'll be able to create shipping methods and payment methods, and see how all that works. Um, there are probably several hundred managers of that demo enterprise, so it might be a bit of a mess. Um, so, you, But you're very welcome to play with our demo hub. Um, that's what that's there for. Um, you're also very welcome, if you'd like, to have a, a, a screen share session with me. So I regularly do sessions like this where you will probably have set up your enterprise already. You might have got a bit stuck on order cycles or something and you want a bit of help. And we can share screens and either I can see your screen and tell you which buttons to press or I can give myself admin access to your enterprise and I can show you what buttons to press and we can sh screen share that way. But we, we, we are here to encourage more people to grow food and list it on the Open Food Network. So if you're a producer, please do list and for more people to set up food hubs and buying groups and online markets and food banks or whatever is needed in your area. Um, and we we are here, we have a support team. Um, and that's the other thing that the, that the contributions pay for is some amazing support people who will answer your queries, help you get started, point you in the right direction. Uh, there's an amazing um, uh, online searchable user guide that you can you can have a look at. I'm really aware I'm running out of time, Catherine. Stop me. That's all right. Don't worry. To. Don't worry. I've got a next one to go. That's all Good. right. Don't worry. <laughs> How are you looking at scaling this? Meaning, will you be taking enough funds in order to cover all the packers' deliveries, etc.? As this is being uh, essentially the middleman. I think that means. Okay. Um, each hub will decide what scale it wants to be. So there are some really big hubs. Um, there are some hubs that took on warehouse space during lockdown and are still trading from warehouses. Um, there are some hubs that don't want to get any bigger, some hubs that run from the back, back room of a pub and the pub has a, you know, the back room has a limit to how many boxes you can actually lay out on a, on a, on a Friday morning and sort their, sort the food into. And so they don't want to get any bigger. Um, many hubs are then linking up with each other that gives them all the ability to scale up by connecting with each other and that increases the turnover to all the producers in that network and it also gives all the shoppers access to a much wider range of products the scale of this thing is entirely up to you and we as much as we want to provide an alternative to supermarkets we we as an organization are not in this to make money we're here to facilitate and enable you to take these tools and to make your own local food systems. So I don't have a sort of world domination plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I simply have a being in service to you amazing people to, who are setting up your own food hubs. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Please That's unmute if, if it doesn't, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, how long does it take a hub to have enough money to pay for staff? Does it depend on how many producers you have in your hub? Mm. That's a really good question. There is a sort of critical mass. Um, some hubs will 
start with a bit of funding and there are bits of funding around now so power to change for a while had some funding for startup food hubs uh, lottery have a really nice community um community enterprise uh, funding stream and they they might give you a couple of thousand to to set up a food hub and pay for someone to actually run it until you've got your turnover up to a level where your markup is going to cover your running costs some hubs will set up a, a set up with a volunteer base. So they'll run entirely without funding and have a really small income stream while the, while the turnover is quite low on the understanding that as soon as the turnover comes up, those people will start to take an income from it. Um, and it does depend a lot on your uh, running costs. So if you're paying rent on a premises, then that obviously is a it can be quite a big expense. Um, it depends how much volunteer help you've got. I'd strongly encourage you not to rely on volunteers. I don't think it's fair or resilient to have a business that is dependent on volunteers, because volunteers may not be able to continue, you know, doing that work. Um, so it's really good to budget to pay for people. Um, and it also depends how quickly the food hub takes off. But yes, um, to start a food hub, you're going to need somebody locally who can produce veg. Um, you're going to need ideally a baker, somebody who's producing bread, bread and cakes. Um, ideally, you're going to want somebody with jams and preserves. Um, if you can find a meat producer, so maybe somebody who is rearing animals um, for, for meat, and for dairy, but but meat is a is a really interesting one. Small scale meat producers are really struggling, again for all sorts of reasons. One of them is to do with local abattoirs being closed, but the other one is that even if they have an abattoir, they have a real stop start um, cycle to their food production. So you might be, you might have a small herd of cattle or sheep or pigs or whatever, but only two or three animals go off for slaughter at a particular time. So when the animals have gone off to slaughter, you will then know that in a week or two's time, you're going to have a lot of meat suddenly arriving back from the abattoir and you're going to need to, to shift it quite quickly or freeze it or store it. If you can use the Open Food Network to, to, to pre-sell that product and you can mm -hmm. pre-sell it months in advance because you know that that meat is going to come back from the abattoir on the 9th of August, start selling it now, get the money in, get the orders ready, know exactly which shoppers have ordered which cuts of meat or which boxes of meat. And then when it comes back from the abattoir fresh, you distribute it all straight away because it's all pre-sold. You don't have to freeze any of it. You don't have to store any of it. That really helps the farmers and growers. But yes, to, 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 to build a food hub, if you can go for high value items like meat, like alcohol, Alcohol is a tricky one in that you then have to have an alcohol license, which involves cost. But these high value products, particularly the high value products like uh, alcohol that has quite a long shelf life. So if you want to store it, you can do. They increase the basket value. They increase the, the turnover through the hub quite quickly. Um, so, yeah, do think about what producers you've got in your area? Have you got a broad enough range? If not, can you bring it in from outside the area? So we, when we set up our food hub, there was nobody producing wine in our area. So we had to go about 30 miles away to the nearest vineyard. Um, but we really wanted wine on our on our food hub. And now that the food hub is big enough, there is now a, a wine producer that's been encouraged by our sales to set up their own vineyard. And we now have a local wine producer, which we wouldn't have had if the food hub hadn't been there to build up that market in the first place. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've got sort of seven or eight more questions. So let's try and pile through mm. and get through those. It'd be lovely to answer everyone's questions. Should a hub be set up before we find producers? So if trying to encourage farmers to think differently, we have an up and running platform for them. I assume immediately for them to get going. Yeah. Sorry, Catherine. Can you say that again? Yeah, I think what they're saying is, is should they set the hub up and then approach farmers and producers to come on board? Or is it worth talking to farmers and producers beforehand yeah. um, to seeing what the, the viability is for them to get involved, I'm assuming, yeah. Um, yeah. prior to yeah. setting up the hub? Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, I would strongly encourage you to find two or three local producers who are very supportive of the idea. 
who are willing to list their products on the hub so that you can set up a hub that's got some live products and some live details. It might be that you don't want to take, start taking orders yet. So you might want to set up an order cycle that is running for six months. <laughs> so you can be really clear to people, you might want to place an order now, but we're not ready to start trading yet. But you can start to see what products are available. You can start to see who are the producers. You can start to see um, pictures of the producers. You can see pictures of the products and so on. But I really would strongly encourage you not to start trading until you've got a, a good range of producers um, covering those basics, the, the, the veg, the bread, possibly the dairy, um, possibly cakes and jams and preserves and that sort of thing. Um, because your shoppers are more, you're, you're more likely to get a, a, a good steady supply of shoppers if you've got a good range of products on there. If they still have to go to the supermarket to get their cheese and their jams and their cakes, they might struggle to justify also putting in a food hub order. Um, so yes, do, do get a broad range if you can. Brilliant. How does local procurement contracts work with the hubs, et cetera? Uh, or for example, do schools buy from the hub? Yes, they do. So the hub will have a contract with the with the school or the hospital or whatever to provide a certain number of product every week. The hub will, in advance, have secured producers and the producers will adjust their stock levels week by week. So when a, an order of 100 kilos of carrots comes in from the school, the hub will be able to see from their open food network screens which producers have got those have got carrots available and then the software will be set up either to take from primary producers first so it will take all of the carrots from one producer and then top up from other producers or it can be set up to take in proportion from those from those producers um so that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip um but basically yes the contract is between the school or the hospital or the prison or the local authority whatever it is and the hub and then the hub has an agreement with the producers to meet that contract brilliant brilliant um someone's just been asking is this being recorded yes it is being recorded and it will be up on our youtube i would imagine tomorrow if not thursday and the links will go out on all our social media. And if you've signed up to the PFFA newsletter, it will go out with that. If you haven't signed up to the PFFA newsletter, I suggest you, you give it a go. It's all free um, and you get lots of information about what's incoming and, and, and stuff throughout the week that happens that might not go out on the socials. Um, let me just see. Got another. Any plans for setting this up in different countries? I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa from mm. Gwyneth. Okay, let me. I wasn't going to do this. I'd forgotten that PFFA. <laughs> well <a> done, wide... Gwyneth. <laughs> yes, thank you, Gwyneth. Um, uh, not that map. I want to do a different map. I want to do this one. The Open Food Network was set up in Australia 21 years ago. No, uh, 12, 13 years ago. I beg your pardon. We brought it to the UK nine years ago. Um, and it's now in 21 different countries. Um, there is an Open Food Network South Africa. Um, I'm talking to a guy called Bevan who is is running that. I don't know the link for it, but if you so this is the map showing all all the different countries where it's trading. Uh, these are where it's operational, these countries, and these are the ones which is it, which are in development, and these are the countries that have shown an interest and we haven't yet actually set up um, in those countries. But there are people in all these different countries interested in in building um, an open food network um, instance. If you go to openfoodnetwork.org, so that we've been looking at openfoodnetwork.org.uk tonight. But if you go to openfoodnetwork.org, this is the global open food network site. Um, and if you go to join us and find your open local open food network, this is where you can con connect with your local instance. Um, and you can basically click here and and um, find out what's going on in those countries. So that's openfoodnetwork.org and then join us. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. 
But and guys, the... um, just so you know, we will be talking um, a little bit down the line about uh, not necessarily maybe affect people on here, apart from maybe Gwyneth. Um, but we will be doing um, some Zooms coming up in a couple of months on how to launch PFFA in your country if you are in another country and i'm sure at some point if there's a lot of interest nick can come back and and, and guide us on that one as well um Sorry. because this isn't just about what we do here the, the impacts of of that happening in food production are affecting so many people across the world and it's so important that we all decentralize our food systems and and have a little bit more say and a little bit more control over what that looks like um and that's whatever country we're in not just the uk but whatever country we're in Absolutely. um do we have any more final questions this evening so i don't want anyone to go away not satisfied they've had their question answered i'll give it one more minute um nick if there's anyone here um who wants to open up a hub i know you've been very generous about um people contacting you and if they're struggling or they've just got thoughts are you happy for them to email you and just kind of request a little bit of your time to help with that definitely i i've just put my email address again i put my email address in the chat there very very happy to talk to anybody who'd like more detail uh, so please do um let me know i'm really happy to to as i say do another screen share session have a one-to-one -one chat with you i've also put the link to the the about page in there and just spotted there's the... one question that's just yeah. sneaked in there oh hang on two hang on two right <laughs> <laughs> go back to the first one bear with me two secs um does a hub have to have a specific legal structure no it doesn't um you choose what you'd like it to be um as i said earlier if as long as you conform to our values and these are the core values that again this is on the, the global website um as long as you're not in breach of any of these which are pretty broad values uh, including kindness which is one of my favorite values uh, but as long as you're being kind to each other <laughs> then you set up a limited company you can set up a public limited company you can set up a, a partnership a sole trader um, you could even be an unincorporated association there's no reason why you need to be incorporated as long as your local trading standards people will be happy with that I mean, during lockdown, people were setting up a food network shop front in their front rooms, in their front yards, and, and they were just trading local food because the supermarkets just weren't coping and people were just spinning up a shop front within, you know, taking an hour or two to spin up a shop front, listing products and getting people to pick up from their, from their front, front yard. Um, and that was absolutely not at all legal organisations. They were just people helping each other out by by distributing food. I love so, the no. fact when you told me the first time I spoke to you, there was a, about an old lady who lived up the road, or I think you might, it might have been a, just an example, yeah. and just selling the apples off her tree yes. um, on yeah. Open Food Network. And that's yeah. what I love about this is the fact yeah. that whilst hubs are great, farmers, producers, et cetera, et cetera, it does welcome the opportunity for people to share produce um, yes. or sell produce that yeah. they've got excess amounts mm. of. Yep, absolutely. It's really building local food systems from the bottom up and encouraging food production at whatever level. So many of those thousands of map icons that we looked at earlier are literally people who once a year have got too many apples or plums or cherries or whatever on their tree and they don't want them to go to waste and they will just stick them up and find a hub that will that will sell them for them. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, final couple of questions. Uh, do you have any printed literature available or is it all online, my love? Uh, we do. We have little leaflets and things. We've got a tiny marketing budget, uh, but we do have leaflets that we take to conferences and stuff. We go to the Oxford Real Farming Conference every year, so we've got a few leaflets that we took there in January. Um, so if somebody, somebody wants some leaflets, send me an email and I'll stick you a few leaflets in the post. Um, the, almost everything that you'll see here is downloadable. So our annual report is a PDF you can download. Most of this stuff you can download and print if you'd like to just make a copy of it. But if you want a paper copy of things, then email me. I'll post it to you. Last question. Um, I can probably answer this, Jack, because it's not going to happen if I've got anything to do with it. How will this work if CBDCs are introduced? Oh, so, Catherine, you'll need to tell me what CBDCs are. Oh, central bank digital currencies. It's something I'm just not going to let happen, though, just so you know, Jack. <laughs> um i don't know anything. i don't know i don't know the answer to that i don't understand that's the first i've heard of it and i don't understand so i can't answer that question um what i do know is that it is possible to 
set up an instance of the Open Food Network that trades in alternative currencies. So there are local exchange trading systems where people are bartering awesome. stuff. And it's, it is possible to deploy the Open Food Network and set the currency to be a, a non-standard currency. Um, but it's cool. Yeah, cool, but complicated. There's all sorts of technical issues in terms of deploying the software, but it is it is feasible, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. absolutely yeah. fantastic. Um, and then final, I know I said final last time, but <laughs> how does a lady selling apples from her tree find local buyers on the OFN? Well, I suppose if people are plugged in and looking for people, because I'd go on that map all the time. Yeah. I'd be looking, yeah. unless I had a hub situation set up, I'd be looking on that hub all the, uh, map all the time for local producers. Yeah. So let me put that link. I'm going to put that link in the chat as well. Control C and chat and map is going into there. So yeah, go to your map, uh, put your location in there. So I'm in Stroud. Just type that in there, and it will zoom in for you to to the, your local area, and you can see what's going on. Uh, you might want to zoom in a bit more, but buried under there somewhere will be our food hub. And what you're looking for is is a as a shop icon like uh, is it there um so these are all in the same place so these these will all be uh set up by the same person somewhere under here oh wait, is it that one that's a shop icon there's one. two shops there isn't there yeah there we go so that shop is our local um so you basically search search for your local area, find a shop icon, which is those, those scales like like this, um, and then click on that, and you'll then get a contact details. You'll get an email address, probably a website, and you'll probably get social media links. Um, Fantastic. That, that's, that's how to find your local hubs. And if there isn't one, set one up, and I'll help yeah. you. Yeah. You know what I'm going to be doing next, don't you? After I've sorted out what I need to on PFFA, I'm setting up a local food hub. I think it'd be brilliant. I'd love to do that. I really right. would. Fantastic. Good. So you're going to get really annoying phone calls from me, Nick. But <laughs> um, guys, thank you so much. There's some lovely comments in the chat, Nick. Um, I think everyone's really, really happy with how it's gone. So thank you so, so much for your time, my friend. Uh, really pleasure. appreciate it. And I think, you know, maybe some months down the line, it'll be worth us considering doing another one because I'm sure there's a lot of people on here who are going to be setting up hubs in the meantime um, and helping to get this moving. At the end of the day, we all need feeding. We all need food. What a wonderful way is to get it from your local uh, suppliers. And it's helping to build that community um, hub. Uh, whether it's food or health or anything else, those hubs are going to become really important moving forward for not just those of us here um, who kind of know there's some issues out there, but there's those that will find out and they'll need that support network. And what a better way to do it um, than working together to get food for everyone from local suppliers. So thank you so, so much, Nick. Um, really appreciate your time. Thank you to everyone for coming along this evening. This will be out um, in the next day or so. So please do share it out there. And um, yeah, go have a wonderful evening and God bless. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you all. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, everybody.